Hey, welcome everybody. Good to see you all here. Welcome to the Alumni Speaker Series at the School of Education. We are so excited to get this, what I hope to be um, a, uh, an ongoing series here at the School of Education with you tonight. I'm really excited that you all are here. Um, so the idea behind the Alumni Speaker Series is to harness the talent the expertise and the wisdom of our alumni to come here and explore with us what it means to teach, learn, and lead in the 21st century, right? And uh, at, at lunch today, we, we, were, we were sitting at lunch, and one of the things that we talked about was how important it is to be able to come together uh, you know, in groups and really think about our practice, right? So I like to call that uh, shop talk. You gotta get together with other people and you gotta talk shop. You gotta talk about what is it that you wanna do in your teaching and how can you make that happen? Come on in, come on in and have a seat. Um, there's, there's some seats up here. And, um, so that's really kind of what the spirit of the uh, Alumni Speaker Series is, right? We're all. We're coming together, we're all interested in teaching, learning, and leading, and we all want to get really good at what we're doing. And uh, the Alumni Speaker Series is one way for us to, uh, to do that. So I just want to get a sense of some folks that are, are in the audience tonight. So do we have some, alum, some alums in the audience tonight? Raise your hand, please. Oh, actually, can you clap? Alums, uh, alums in the house. Excellent. How about um, classroom teachers? Classroom teachers. Any classroom teachers in the house? Excellent. Okay. How about uh, school leaders? Do we have some school leaders here? Come on, clap! We need to hear the clap. That's right. That's right. Uh, do we have some education professors here? We've got some education professors. Great. And uh, do we have just people? that decided to come because this looks really interesting and I'm interested in teaching, learning, and leading. Anybody? Okay, we, we got some. And then finally, we have students who are preparing to be teachers in, in, the, in the house. All right. Great, so we have all these different people coming together and what's interesting about that is that all of these different people actually need to come together in order for us to be really good teachers and really good leaders, right? We all need to be working together, thinking about this stuff and working on it um, to, to push this kind of grand experiment forward. So um, that's the spirit behind this. I, I figured, I guess I should have introduced myself. <laughs> I'm the interim dean of the School of Education. I'm Leif Gustafson. Um, so I have a few thank yous I want to make and then I'm going to introduce Naomi, our, our, our special guest and speaker tonight. So uh, I want to thank uh, Jan Walbert for helping us to uh, set all this up, Patricia Shuhai, Joanne Bosaurus, and Mary Dress for all the behind the scenes work. Megan, Teresa, Chelsea, and Tori are intrepid uh, work study students. John McNeil, who drove around in a little golf cart and put the signs up for where to go today in the Maelstrom, right? Mike and Justin in IT, enabling me to hold this mic in my hand. Uh, Joe Lynn uh, for helping us to film the event, getting my good side, and Naomi's I hope. Uh, Parkhurst for uh, the food that will come in the reception at the end, and of course all of you for, uh, for being here. Um, so before the event I went on to Twitter. How many are on Twitter? Okay, next time we come I want to see all hands up. Uh, but I went on to Twitter because I was kind of interested, like what are people thinking about in terms of teaching, learning, and leading in, um, in early childhood with young children? What, what are the questions that people have? What, what are the challenges that we're facing? What, what does that look like right now at this time? And I got some people uh, responding. So I just want to kind of, this is kind of what's swirling in the air. And maybe it will connect with some of um, what you're thinking too. Uh, so one person tweeted in, how do you not let requirements get in the way of good teaching? Um, 
Another person uh, tweeted in, what do early childhood center directors really need to know? Uh, what's the best way to get parental engagement in early childhood learning? And then uh, an, an email that I got too, uh, th these four kind of capture what people were sending me. How do we push back against those that think play is a waste of time and that traditional reading and math need to come earlier and earlier in early childhood? What kinds of advocacy should we be doing about the value of play? Right? So that's, that's swirling around in this and it's swirling around in the world that Naomi inhabits and, and it certainly is um, stuff that Naomi is thinking about uh, um, in her work and will help us think about too with our with the provocative title of what's buried in the sand what's buried in the sandbox <laughs> in a world of sandboxes <laughs> fostering creativity problem solving caring and independence in young children uh, so I wanted I had a chance to visit with Naomi and I, I got to go down to Texas and see the yellow school where she directs and be with the kids as they were playing outside and um, just kind of love the space and the flow of it and the way that the uh, teachers talked about teaching and learning and the joy of the children that were at the school. And it was at that time that I thought, Naomi, hey, you gotta come on up here and you gotta, you gotta talk with us. So um, that's kind of when this all started last spring. Naomi Black is the director of the Yellow School, MDPC's early childhood program serving children three years old through kindergarten. Naomi was born and raised in New Jersey, graduated from Arcadia University in Pennsylvania. It was Beaver College then, yes. Uh, did postgraduate studies at Keene College in New Jersey and graduate studies at University of Phoenix. She has more than 30 years experience in early childhood education. 13 as a classroom teacher, teaching preschool through third grade. Naomi began teaching at the Yellow School in 1978 and became the director in 1983. She has 25 years experience as a children's choir director and is the music teacher at the school. Naomi also trains teachers at a number of conferences including Macy, Hasey, and Tacey. That sounds like a children's book, doesn't it? Macy, Hasey, and Tacey. She and her husband, Charlie, have five children and 12 grandchildren. And so we are so fortunate to have you here, Amy. We're really excited to hear you talk. And after Naomi's talk, we're going to open it up for a question and answer, which is why you have your, your three by five cards, right? And so we're going to sit here in the actor's studio, and, uh, and we'll get to have a conversation together in the room. So can we uh, please put our hands together and welcome Naomi Black. Thank you very much. It's my honor and privilege to be here and to be the first speaker. I guess I get to set the bar, so anybody who comes after me is lucky. Uh, <laughs> um, the world has changed tremendously in the last 50 years. Um, of course, Beaver College is no longer Beaver College, but my diploma does say um, that I, I graduated from Arcadia University Beaver College of Education, so it's still in there, alive and kicking. Um, you know, the campus is different, everything is different, but um, mostly technology has made a huge difference in our lives over the course of the years, not just in children's lives, but in our lives too. Um, I, I read a book once that kind of blamed it all on Sesame Street, and that may or may not be true. Um, the fact that Sesame Street gave children things in little short bursts, um, and that kind of got picked up by the rest of TV. And if you watch a sitcom now, you watch what, five minutes and then there are three minutes of various and sundry commercials that come along. So everything we get is in little short bursts. Um, we, when we communicate with people, it's through texting or tweeting or whatever and it's all little short bursts. Um, there's not the push to have a, a long, time with anything. We don't spend a long time sitting and reading long books and having long conversations because we're all in a big hurry and there's so many things, so many demands on us. And with children, uh, you have those kinds of things. You also had that deregulation of marketing. 
um, where suddenly we went from having just cartoons that kind of appealed to boys and girls. You went from Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and Captain Kangaroo, which were wonderful programs for all kids, to the Power Rangers and the te teenage, teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the princess things. So we suddenly, and of course young children, are very egocentric, number one, and number two, they're very black and white in their thinking. So boys suddenly are now solving all their problems with karate chops and fighting, because that's what they see, and girls are all wanting to look beautiful and be little fairy princesses and kind of make me want to barf. <laughs> However, <laughs> and so we need at this point in our lives, in our teaching careers, to meet children where they are and somehow or other get them to get some creativity back in their lives because we have also noticed over the years that children don't really know how to play. They know how to imitate what they see on TV. They know how to imitate what they see in their video games, but they don't really know how to play. So once they finish that imitation, they're onto more kicking and fighting or more fairy princesses. Um, and there's very little in between. It's difficult for them to make connections between experiences they've had, things they know, and something new that comes up. So we really need to work with them and help them learn how to make those, those uh, connections. Another thing that has um, added into what we're seeing now in our classrooms is that more and more families are working outside the home. We have. Um, I've forgotten the statistics exactly, but more, more families than not, I think, have two parents who are out working, which means they need more childcare, which means children are in more um, structured environments and they have less time to just be out playing, which is where play comes in is a very important thing because play is not just some fun activity where the kids go out and run around and the teachers can say, we can rest for a few minutes. Um, play serves a very, very important uh, part in the education of children. Play is where they learn um, language skills. You've got to keep a good play scenario going, and in order to do that, you need to be able to communicate. That's why you see biting with two-year-olds, because they don't have the language to communicate. You don't see that much of that when they get to be four or five, because they have the facility to use language and solve problems that way. But um, because they're in so many organized activities where there's always somebody telling them what to do and how to do it and when to do it, they're not having the opportunities to learn a lot about self-regulation, about problem solving, about cooperation. Corporations spend thousands of dollars sending people off to be trained to cooperate with each other. You could learn that on the playground. You know, the guy who wrote everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten had a point. Uh, there is a lot to be learned from that. Another thing where we kind of need to work for a balance is this whole business between uh, writing and technology. And when I was a kid, we played with clay. Now, um, how many of you have played with clay? Good. It's hard. You know, you have to work hard at clay. You have to warm it up, and it takes a lot of effort. But do we give our kids clay now? Oh, we give them Play-Doh. Does Play-Doh take any effort? No. Um, so they, they play with Play-Doh and they do all of their things and that's good. There's nothing wrong with Play-Doh. It's just that they're not building up those fine motor muscles that they need for writing. So when I was a kid, we wrote with crayons. And in order to make a really satisfying mark, you have to push hard with a crayon. But do we give our kids crayons anymore? No, we give them markers. And we give them markers starting when they're very young. So they get used to making very satisfying, very beautiful, very vibrant marks on their papers with these crayon markers that take no effort whatsoever to use. It's another thing that takes away from that fine motor muscle development. Um, we, we do, uh, we, in, in, um, Oh, glue sticks. Glue sticks are another example. That's pretty easy to just rub a glue stick on. It's not very messy. It dries right away. You can take your paper home. Uh, it's all part of the kind of instant gratification that we're all a part of, including myself. 
Um, but again, they're not getting that exercise of squeezing the glue bottle, learning to control that glue as it comes out, um, beginning to understand that if they make a really big puddle, it's gonna take five days for it to dry. And no, you can't take it home today. Um, but you know, all of that is good because it teaches them delayed gratification. It helps their fine motor muscles. So then they go to school and we get them into all this technology and they're doing touch screens and all that sort of thing. And then, at least in Texas, um, we give them standardized tests and we say, right. Well, they can't do it. They just don't have the muscles in their fingers. So somehow or other, we need to look at all of these things that we're doing and the things children need, and we need to find ways to make connections. We need to find ways to make sure that we have play in our programs um, while we're still meeting our goals. Now, Texas, I'm sorry to say, has very, very minimal standards. Um, in order to be an early childhood teacher, you have to be 18, you have to have a high school diploma or a GED, and you have to have, as of two years ago, 24 clock hours of education. That's it. That's appalling. My nail girl has to have more training than that. The guy who picks up roadkill on the side of the road gets more training than that. But this is what we have. Um, in our school, we don't follow those minimum standards. Um, our teachers, our lead teachers, all have to have at least a bachelor's degree. Many of them have masters. Um, she's not with me now, but I had a teacher for a number of years who had a doctorate. Um, <clears throat> it was in psychology. Um, we have assistant teachers, some of whom do not have um, college degrees, but most of them do. And uh, I really feel that the more education you have, the better teacher you're going to be. Now, that being said, just because you have a good education doesn't make you a good teacher. And um, I am also not necessarily in the same mindset as NACI was when they changed their accreditation standards that said everybody has to have an early childhood degree because I think there are lots of, of um, experiences that people have had and and degree programs that people have had that can work very well with early childhood. I do, however, think that you need to have a strong background in child development because though the world has changed, children and their needs have not changed. Children develop in the same way. Those same neural connections have to be made before they can actually decode, before they can actually read because reading is a very complex problem process. Um, you can train a child to do a lot of things. You can have a child memorize sight words, but that doesn't mean they can read. And the parent who comes in and says, oh, my child can read. He read this book last night. If you take those same words and put them in a different context, they don't know them. So it's not really reading. It's on the road to reading. It's part of the process. It's a good thing. It should happen. It should be a celebrated, but it's not reading yet because they're not quite there. And this push to read when kids are in pre-K or, or kindergarten, I think is really wrong. There's a lot of research out there that shows that it's not all that important whether you learn to read at four or at seven. There's also a lot of research out there that shows that you can do more harm by pushing them ahead than good. Somehow we don't look at that research or pay attention to it. So we, we're, we're in this big hurry, and I'm not really sure why we're in such a hurry. Because by third grade, it's unless there are extenuating circumstances, it's probably going to work out just fine. And you probably know in um, Finland and some of the Scandinavian countries, they don't even start teaching formal reading until kids are seven, because that's about the time that you're really ready for it, and it all kind of clicks. Um, my granddaughter is a great example of that. She is now a freshman in high school, and of course, I have to brag, she's of course very bright. Uh, when she went to kindergarten, she had a vocabulary that was off the charts, but that's because her mother is a Latin teacher, and um, has never skimped on vocabulary when talking with her children. But Carter, smart as she was, verbal as she was, did not read until she was in first grade. 
because that's when her brain was ready to make all those connections. Now, she's pretty much a straight A student and she reads voraciously, but my daughter, having, you know, being a teacher, knew that it, she didn't need to obsess with all the other parents that Carter was not reading in kindergarten, and I'm very pleased that she could do that and be comfortable with it. So, um, <clears throat> getting on, I want to show you some pictures of some of the ways that we, some of the things that we do at our school that help make these connections. Um, the what is buried in the sandbox thing came from a story that I told Leaf. Um, when we, we built a new playground a year ago, and when we built the sandbox, um, I had been visiting a, a neighboring school, and they had this dinosaur skeleton in their sandbox. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be cool? You know, all kids love dinosaurs, and we do dinosaurs at our school. That is so neat. We're going to spend the extra money and have a dinosaur in our sandbox. Okay, we've had this new playground for one entire school year, and we're a month and a half or so into the second school year. And so far, we're still asking that question. You know why? Because kids don't have the attention span to stick with it long enough to find it. They almost did last year, but they haven't yet. So the question still remains, what's buried in the sandbox? <laughs> but um, we try really hard. Now we, we follow the state standards for pre-K and we follow the state standards for kindergarten so that when our children leave, they're ready to go on into the public schools. And you can get all that on the Texas Education website. Um, but what we do is take all of those goals and the skills that we need to teach children and we try to do it in very developmentally appropriate ways. And we try to be very flexible and give the kids a lot of opportunity to play and create on their own. So let me show you some of these pictures that we have. Um, back to technology, I saw this on a Facebook page the other day and I thought, oh, I need to throw that in the presentation because it's so true. You know, 20 years ago, we had all this stuff and we went from various kinds of tapes and, you know, I, I play records still every once in a while and the kids say, woo, that's a big CD. <laughs> like, yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, now it's all on your iPhone. You can fit it in your pocket. I mean, it's amazing how things have changed. But the basic needs have not. And that third one, that belonging needs, I think that's one of the most important. Because if you don't feel comfortable in your surroundings, it's going to be very difficult for you to learn. And, you know, people come up with a lot of things and a lot of ways that they think might make children comfortable. But I think the bottom line is being accepting of children and letting them know that you are accepting of them. Um, they may have an idea or an action that is not appropriate, but you can work with that and show them and help them grow with it so that you're beginning to get more appropriate comments and actions and activities. But if they're in an environment where they know that they're cared about, where they know that they're free to say things and discuss things, uh, they're going to be much better able to learn. And that's the kind of thing that we need to provide for them. And sometimes that's really hard. Um, we talked a little bit this morning about the fact that sometimes um, parents obsess over whether or not I should send them on to kindergarten. Are they developmentally ready? Should they stay in preschool another year? What would be the best thing to do? And the schools say, oh, you need to send them to us because we will provide what they need. And that is a really wonderful plan, but unfortunately it doesn't always happen because you have these schedules that need to be followed for one reason or another, and we tend to fit the kids into the schedules rather than fitting the schedule to the needs of the child. Um, so I would encourage you as you are in classrooms or going into classrooms that you find ways to be creative to kind of work around some of those things. Here is the aforementioned sandbox. Um, and the kids play in it quite a lot, and they do a lot of digging, just not deep enough. <laughs> um, we have a program called our Grandpa Program. And the grandpas are retired men who are either members of the church 
or um, they are actual grandpas of some of our kids, or they're just you know friends of somebody who loves children and likes to come and do this. And we have a couple of people on our parent advisory committee who are uh, who have are kind of the liaisons with the grandpas, and they keep um, these boxes of wood in our shed, and they're different shapes and sizes. And the kids will go to the grandpas and say, well, today I want to build a mermaid or a race car or a doll bed or any one of a number of things. And then the grandpas help them find the correct sizes and shapes and help them put them together. So here's a, a grandpa working with a little girl. I think she was making a dog. <laughs> and sometimes, we continue that into the classroom. So uh, these children were actually making a class story based on the things that they built. So we have a Yoda statue and then a cool race car appeared. And they did a whole story based on all of the different things that they had built that day. Um, we also, I don't know, do you have art car parades in Philadelphia? Well, Houston has a big art car parade, and, and I've, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the American artist who kind of started this out. Um, I know that there are some in various cities and towns across the country, but people take cars and they decorate them in absolutely unbelievable ways. It's very, very cool. And so um, every year we have a book fair and uh, an art show as part of a family night at our school. And we had the kindergarten children, they studied about this artist, and then we had them make cars, and their own art cars. And um, <clears throat> they made their cars with the grandpas, and they took them home, and then they decorated them at home, and we encouraged the parents not to do it for them, to let them do it themselves. We had a little boy who um, had been diagnosed mid-year as being on the autism spectrum, and when he came to us, he was, he had very low self-esteem. Um, he just really didn't feel that he could do anything. He had very bad school experiences. And he got really into this art car thing, and he raided his father's tackle box, and he did a whole big fishing car. And he was so excited. I, I almost put in a picture of him. I'm sorry I didn't. But he was holding up his, his fishing car, and he was just as excited and proud of himself as he could be. So it's really nice to kind of interconnect all of these, these things, because you never know how, what wonderful things may come out of it. Now this, uh, I had visited a school, um, and they were doing a letter of the week, and they had given the children um, an eight and a half by 11 picture of an elephant, and the children all had to color it. Guess what? Gray. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but every elephant looked exactly the same. And, um, and then I came back to our school, and a couple of weeks later, somehow elephants came into the conversation, and suddenly we had kids who had picked up blocks as trunks, and they're marching around the room being elephants. Uh, we also had other children who decided to make elephant ears, so we got out gray paper, and they cut out elephant ears and put it on headbands, and then they took the scraps and scotch taped them to their nose and their bottoms, and they did an elephant march all around the room. So, you know, just having things available for them is enough to stimulate some of these things so that they can start learning and being creative and doing things a little differently. Now, one of our field trips the only field trip for our three-year-olds is a trip back to the school from 6.30 to 7 at night. And we do it in January when it's kind of dark. Um, it is amazing because though there's lots of light in the parking lot around, the playground is dark enough to look very, very different. And the kids come with flashlights and glow sticks and all kinds of stuff, and they have a great time. In our old building, we had a, one of those... Um, light sensitive lights on the side of the building and the daddies had the best time going around and that was before we had a lot of lighting on the parking lot so the daddies would go around and they'd shine their flashlight on the little sensor thing so the light would go out and it would be pitch black dark out there and the moms are all going no no don't do that put it back on <laughs> but i mean look at this child he is having so much fun in that sandbox just feeling the sand run through his toes and looking at it in the dark with his flashlight that's just such a great sensory experience. Um, so and they run around, they, they play. We don't have a lot of equipment on our sandbox. We're very into just stuff that they can move around and do things with and natural elements. 
Um, so it's really fun to, to watch and see what they do. Now, you know, here's the pumpkin carving. Everybody does pumpkin carving, and you may all do some of these other things I'm going to talk about, and I hope you do. Um, we, of course, talk about where pumpkins come from, and um, of course, the kids all say the pumpkin patch at the Methodist Church down the street, and yeah, that's where we get them from, but is that where they came from? No, so we discuss the planting routine. And then, of course, they take it all out and they make their jack o' lanterns, but once the jack o' lantern is gone, we cut them up. And we peel them, the kids cut them, and we cook it, and we make pumpkin bread and pumpkin muffins. And then with some of the seeds, we do art activities, and some of the seeds, we do math activities. Some of the seeds we plant in our garden, and then we always take part of somebody's jack-o'-lantern that still has a few seeds left in it, and we just put it outside in the dirt, and we watch what happens, and we make predictions and we graph it, and we observe it, and we keep a log of what's happening. Um, last year's pumpkin got put out, and just a few days later, we had a torrential rain, and thought, eh, that's probably the end of that. But it wasn't. Um, eventually, it started to rot and kind of fold in on itself, and then little sprouts started coming up, and pretty soon, we had a pretty good pumpkin vine growing. Unfortunately, then it got really, really hot, and it was out in the morning sun and it fried. But those are all great learning experiences. And that's the wonderful thing about experiments. They don't have to really work out right because they work out the way they work out. And that in itself is a great learning experience. Um, again, because we don't want everything to look the same because people don't all look the same and trees and dogs don't all look the same. Uh, why should everybody's spider look the same? So when we study spiders, we just give the kids a lot of materials and let them create. So you can see we have a number of different spiders up there, and they all look different, as spiders do. Um, again, these, these little girls wanted to play in the dollhouse, and the dollhouse furniture was not readily available. Um, and they didn't want to wait for somebody to go find it, so they made their own. Um, we just got out lots of materials. Um, I'll show you another picture that's a close up. They took spools and they wrapped some um, construction paper around them and they made the chairs and then they drew pictures of people and glued the people to the spools. And then they took shells and beads and that sort of thing. Some of the shells they painted, uh, some they left plain and they set the table, they made the tables, and they set the table, and the beads were the food that they had in their dishes. So, you know, you can see things like this really gets the mind going. It really gives them opportunities to be creative. Now there's the, the whole scene. If y'all have any questions as I'm going along, please stop me, ask for any clarifications or additional information. Um, as I said, we have a lot of natural elements on our playground, and um, we had had a bird build a nest in a tree right on the playground, and it was a fairly low tree. The kids could not see into it, but we could, and um, we found that there were three eggs in the nest, and so we took pictures of it and printed them out so the kids could see the pictures, and then the, the eggs hatched and the babies were there, so we took pictures of that, and we took pictures of the babies with their beaks open. We talked a lot about the birds and watched their progress, and then they finally blew, uh, flew away. But these kids decided they would build a bird's nest, and I think they did an admirable job. <laughs> now, in our old playground, um, and I do miss this element, but the, most of the playground was sand. So when we had a rain, we got great puddles. And um, the kids would go out there, and they would really explore, and they had a wonderful time digging channels and making rivers flow in various directions, and it was a great um, opportunity for them. We don't, we don't get so many puddles now. Um, these children decided to do some planting in the river. I think the parents are happy because their kids are not coming home with sand everywhere, but um, I kind of miss it. Now, this is an example of um, cooperative play. Um, there, I don't think there's anybody in the school who could have stuck with this project long enough to accomplish it on his or her own. But working together, these kids um, put together these things into a very, very long strip. 
these are, I, I don't remember what they're called, they're little flexible plastic things that hook together. And I actually found them at a teacher's conference. They were actually marketing them for special education programs. And they can be used by kids, young children, all the way up through adults, because you can make all kinds of things with them. They're flexible and they hook together, so sometimes we have boys who make ties to wear around their necks with them, and uh, you can make keychains, I and mean, you can do all kinds of things. But these kids decided they were gonna see, again, you know, young children kind of live superlatives, so uh, the biggest, the best, the longest, whatever. So they were gonna make the longest. Now, we have, our, our school is kind of U-shaped, and there is a multi-purpose room that's at the, the cross part of the U. And there's a kitchen at one end, and the playground at, at, is at the other end. And I don't know, Leaf, would you say that it's the multi-purpose room is maybe as long as this room is wide? Yeah. About like that? Yeah. So that's how long this thing was that we put together. Um, so as you can imagine, it took a while to do that. Here's another view of it. Now the kindergarten class uh, had a different take on it. And they worked together and made this very complex arrangement. Isn't that cool? And they were very proud. And you know, I, I love it because whenever they do anything, it's Mrs. Black, Mrs. Black, come see, come see. And I think that's great. Here's another. Yes? Can I ask just about the demographics of your school? How many students are in your school? How many classes do you have? Like, what's the average class size? Okay. Do they lose by chance? Are they what? Do they loop? Do they go from like the third, the third grade group or the pardon me, the three year olds stay together as four year olds no. and stay with the same no. teacher or anything? No. Like um, no, we have we have a total of about 102 children in the school, but they're not all there every day. We have a Monday, Tuesday three year old class, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday three year old class, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday three year old class. So we have three 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 year old classes. Then we have a three-day pre-K, a five-day pre-K, an afternoon class that meets five days a week, but because they don't share their teaching space with anyone else, it's the only class in the school where you can start out coming three days a week and add on a fourth day or a fifth day if you want to. But within that, that being said, it's either um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Tuesday through Friday, or Monday through Friday, so they can't loosey-goosey pick whatever days they want. And then, of course, the kindergarten class, which is five days. Um, we're basically a half-day program. Our morning classes are from 8.45 to 11.45. Um, our kindergarten goes from 8.45 to 1. And then all of our classes have one built-in long day. Um, it's either Tuesday or Thursday. And the afternoon class has the built-in morning, so their morning is on Thursday. Um, we found that our kids were um, all stay, all of our family stayed at least one day anyway. And because we have these two day and three day classes, when we start putting in a music class and the grandpas and Spanish and all that other stuff, it makes it really hard to get everything in that you want to do. So we decided to have a built in long day. Um, just to give us a little extra time so that we could do some of these extra things without feeling stressed. Um, we have, as I say, those seven classes. There are typically 16 children in a class, no more than that, and we have two teachers in each class. Um, we, we call it a lead teacher and an assistant teacher, um, and the lead teacher does have the ultimate responsibility, but we really encourage the teachers to work together as far as planning needs are concerned, uh, with parent-teacher conferences, um, with all, you know, we, we're not into roles, designated roles. Um, I had to laugh when Lee said one of the Twitter questions was, what does an early childhood director really need to know? Uh, well, you need to know everything, like how to fix a toilet, and how to um, do housekeeping chores, and how to clean up messes, and. Um, you know, there's kind of a little of everything that goes into this job, which is kind of interesting. But anyways, that, does that answer your question? Okay, so the point is, if it needs doing, whoever's closest to it does it. Um, so we're not into really designated roles as such. 
Um, now, of course, it is Texas, and we have to have our longhorn cattle, and so this is another way we measure. Those are, those are the horns on the longhorn, and we measured how many children long it was, and we measured how many cowboy boots long it was. Again, I, I mentioned before, we, we don't have a lot of equipment on the playground. We do have a big climbing structure, and we have a tire swing, but um, mostly we have a lot of uh, just stuff out there that the kids can move around. And these boys were just um, changing around the configuration of the tires and walking on them and balancing on them and that sort of thing. Um, we've had kids that stack them all up and get in it and pretend it was a bird's nest and they were the birds in the nest. So again, the more things that you can put out and the, way, the ways that you can kind of um, introduce them with maybe a story or uh, something that'll kind of get their juices going, uh, the, better, the better opportunities they have for being cooperative with each other, for having that language development, for caring for each other, because they have to be able to work together. Uh, these kids, um, and this again is back to the old playground, since our new playground so new, um, they decided to build a garden in the wagon, so they were working together on that. And this is a close-up of it, so you can see all the natural elements they use to incorporate in their garden. We're using chewed pine cones and sticks and grasses. Um, we've had this horrible drought in Texas, and unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we have lost six huge old oak trees. Um, we're in the process of trying to plant more trees, but of course it takes a long time for a tree to grow. Um, but when we cut down a tree, we try to use as much of it as we can. So when, with our last tree, we just had the men um, stack up a lot of the pieces of it, so it becomes a place to sit on and chat, or to climb on, or to jump off of. Um, so we try to incorporate those kinds of things too, which is pretty neat. Um, there's another part of that tree which is going to be used at the church to set up an African village sometime this month. And when they're finished with it, they'll bring them back to us. And at the far end of the playground, and down at that end, we have another, a small deck. And so we're going to put some of those logs around that deck as a seating area so that we can use that for some musical productions and for some dramatic areas and that sort of thing. Now, in all my years of teaching, I have only seen this once. And this was two years ago, and we had a group of kids who did this vertical structure against the wall. Is that not cool? <laughs> I mean, what they learned about balance, it was amazing. I love that. They even have little architectural added touch down here. <laughs> Pardon me? Um, they probably stood on they probably stood on chairs. You know, sometimes we let them do things that we probably shouldn't let them do. <laughs> but hey. <laughs> now, those kids you know, some of the things that they build with are very stable, and some are, are not so stable. And they built that in sections, and they actually found that it was a little too tall. And they couldn't make it stand up. So they did a little redesign, and then they called me in to see if I could reach the top of it. And even standing on a chair, I could not. Um, big Legos are great to play with outside. It was interesting, we had a mom come the other day and uh, her child was interested in Legos and when I said we had both big and small, he kind of turned up his nose at big. And I thought, you know, he needs to learn, and if he were in this kind of a situation, that big is not necessarily for babies because you can do some pretty cool things with big ones. You can build a whole house. Um, and these kids wanted it even bigger, so they enlisted in the aid of a taller teacher. And they decided to build umbrellas. <laughs> now, sometimes things just happen that are surprises and become very teachable moments. And this was a gourd patch that just appeared. 
Um, I'm, you know, we were we were talking with the children about how birds move seeds, and of course they thought it was really funny that one of the ways that birds plant seeds is by pooping them out. You know, Four-year-olds love that kind of stuff. <laughs> but apparently that's what happened because as I was walking across the parking lot one day in the summer, I saw this vine growing, and I thought, oh, I wonder what that is and where it came from. And so I told the guys that mow the lawn and stuff to just leave it. And it grew and grew and grew. And by the time the kids came, we had this really huge vine patch with flowers and um, what ultimately turned out to be gourds. So we did lots of experimentation with them. First of all, we didn't know what they were. And so we cut them open and found that it didn't look like anything we'd really want to eat. And we tried drying some on the vine, and we tried drying some inside. And some dried, and you could shake them and hear the seeds inside, and some just molded. Um, but we did all kinds of things with it. And again, it was an opportunity for bringing in those more academic goals, and the, 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 um, the, the keeping records, writing observations, making predictions, doing the graphing, all of that sort of thing. So, I mean, there are all these teaching moments that are just out there. We just have to have our eyes open so that we can take advantage of it. The kids were very interested in it. They made a sign, see, we bring in literacy. And we had the sign out there for our gourd patch. And then once the gourds were all gone and um, the frost came, such as we get in Houston, and we pulled them all up, um, it was also interesting to just check out the patch and see what was left, if anything. So they explored that for a while. Now, um, for years, I've been talking with the parents about the importance of the process rather than the product. And um, I had, this picture reminded me of um, a mom who had had three children go through the school and her fourth was currently there. And she had come to share her flute with the kids in the class and in her daughter's class and decided she would stay and just observe for a little while. And her daughter went over to the easel and started painting and she was mixing paints. And as she did, she said, oh, mom, look at this. Mom, look what color it is now. Mom, check this out. And by the time she finished, the end result was kind of this big sort of brownish grayish blob. And her mother said, you know, I've heard you talk for years about the process, not the product. But she said, now I really get it because I had an opportunity to see the excitement and the involvement and how engaged my daughter was in this whole process. If she had just brought that home, I would have trashed it. You know, who wants a big old gray blob picture? Um, but she said, I saw what she did, and it makes a huge difference. Um, and so here she is, a, a many years later, doing the same kind of thing, enjoying mixing all those colors and making new things. Um, and there's Nicholas doing it with two hands. Uh, we try to give the kids a lot of different kinds of implements with which to paint or draw. Um, we use crayons at our school. We use sidewalk chalk. We use chalk. Um, we paint with um, pine, pine needles as well as paint brushes. We do thick ones and thin ones. We look at the differences in the size of the lines. Um, we paint inside and outside. We have on our new playground um, an outside deck with a big plexiglass kind of wall at, along one end. And they can paint on the plexiglass with either paint or just water or shaving cream. So, you know, it's, it's just an, a great opportunity to kind of do all kinds of things. And again, work on those fine motor muscles. The kindergartners actually study a lot of great artists. And then they have an opportunity to uh, create their own interpretations. So this is um, Monet's water lilies. And, and the teachers don't help with that. I mean, we read the books and we talk about it and we um, call their attention to the lines and the colors and all of that sort of thing, and then they do it. Um, one of their favorites is, of course, um, <clears throat> I do have senior moments. Okay, who's the, who's the artist that just Jackson came? Pollock. Yeah, Jackson Pollock. Right? And we do that outside. <laughs> they love the Jackson Pollock, and we take it out on my lawn and just um, Gus made an igloo. <laughs> um, you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on materials. <laughs> he made an igloo. And look at the concentration here. You know, and again, these kids are learning about balance, they're learning about 
how to control the amount of glue. If you have too much glue, the stuff's not going to bounce. It's going to fall off. There's a, there's a lot of learning that happens in these kinds of activities. We recycle, and we really um, talk with the children a lot about being good stewards of the world. Um, when they finish their lunches, they uh, wash out their plastics and they put them in the in the proper container. And we recycle paper and uh, we recycle all kinds of things and encourage families to do that at home. And we make paper with the children, and that's really fun to do. Uh, we'll take paper out. There. Stuff that's been shredded in the shredder, we use that, and we use the paper that they've put in the recycling bins in their classrooms and mix it all up in the blender with water and they press it all out on screens and let it dry. And sometimes we put um, pieces of ribbon in it and sometimes we put glitter in it. And it's kind of, again, another one of those things where these materials are available, kids. What do you want to try? And let's see what happens. And uh, we put it out to dry in the Houston sun and make paper. Uh, again, it's Texas, and we do want the children to learn about their culture, and uh, this young lady is actually a former Yellow School student. That's another neat thing. We have a lot of kids who have been through the school who um, keep a connection with the school and will come back and share a musical instrument with us or an, a, some sort of an activity with us, and she's very big in the horses, so she brought her saddle. But in order to explain to a three or four year old how that works, they needed a horse. So here I am. <laughs> That's another thing you need to know when you're a preschool group. Um, we do a lot of cooking activities with the children. And of course, cooking is great for science and math um, because you get all that measuring and you see how heat changes the properties of things. So. Um, the kids have, we brought in yellow, green, and red apples, and we talked about which ones were the favorites, and we graphed that, and then we cut them. I realized when I looked at this picture up close and personal, it looks like she's about to cut her thumb off. <laughs> um, she didn't. <laughs> um, and then we cooked it, and then we made applesauce the old-fashioned way, and it was delicious. It was a big hit. It was quite delicious. And sometimes we just have sensory activities. There's the slime and the gap and the glop and all of those fun things. Um, and the kids really enjoy getting into that. That was probably taken during the summer program. Um, we have water day on Thursday so the kids can wear their bathing suits and just get wet and dirty and we pose them down. And take them back <laughs> and now we're back to the sandbox and the mystery that has still not been solved. So, don't tell, nobody, even the teachers don't know it's there. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, so, lots to think about and, and, and talk about. Do you wanna, um, if you have a question, you want to write down a question on the card and pass it out to the side and I'll collect them. Um, uh, and hopefully some of the student workers can just go up and down the, the, the side aisles here and pick up the questions and bring them down to me. That'd be great. But we don't need to, um, to uh, wait until those questions are collected. I, I'm, it's really open now for conversation and thinking out loud and questions as we sit in these really comfortable chairs and look very official. Um, so uh, what are, I've, I've got all kinds of things, but I'm going to throw it back out to you. What, what, what are you thinking about? What questions you have? Sir. Um, hey, uh, two things really quick. Um, first, I just want to mention the grandpa program is one of the greatest ideas I've ever heard. Thank that's, you. That's fantastic. Like, that was just a comment. <laughs> you get that sense of community in there, and you get everyone around the school. Um, I also was wondering, you mentioned um, earlier on about the boys with their Power Rangers and karate and the girls with their princesses. Um, how much do you think is that of that is instinctual as opposed to prescribed gender roles? Well, yeah, some of it is. Um, boys do tend to to go towards more active, physical kinds of things. And that's good. <clears throat> I was read, re reading recently um, 
a, a, a book about the fact that um, young boys really often do better with male teachers than with female teachers because female teachers try to be protective and stop some of that rough and tumble play, whereas guys, male teachers will get in there with them and keep it keep kids from hurting themselves, but are more understanding of the need for boys to do that sort of thing. Um, so yes, yeah, some of it is, and it has always been, and I don't have any problems with that. Um, I used to rough and tumble with my brother until he got bigger than I was and beat me up. But, um, but what's happening now is there's so much emphasis on that sort of thing that kids are getting all the time with their TV programs, with the video games that they play. I noticed with my grandson um, one day, who actually does not do a whole lot of media stuff because my daughter won't let him, but you know he does it with his friends and he's exposed to it. I mean, even, even if you've protected your child so much they've never seen any of this stuff, Somehow they still know because they hear from their friends. But um, his thing was, you know, it, it's all about killing. That's how you solve problems, it's killing. Well, there are other ways to solve problems. So I'm not against the activity and the fighting and that sort of stuff. It's the fact that it's so narrow in scope. And what we need to do is help them find ways to kind of expand that in safe ways, but still in ways in which that'll work. And the same with the girls. You know, they may tend more towards um, drawing more specific things. I mean, if you look at a picture that was drawn by a four-and-a-half-year-old girl and one that was drawn by a four-and-a-half-year-old boy, you know immediately which sex did it because the little girls is going to have eyelashes and flowers and grass and all of those details, and boys are not. It's going to be a big movement kind of thing. Um, so there are definitely gender differences, but again, you don't want a little girl to think nothing about anything except body image and how she looks and how you can only be a princess. I mean, how boring is that? There's so much more to life. And you want girls to be able to, I mean, I thought we fought this battle years ago, and we're going to have to fight it all over again. <laughs> so yeah, there are some gender issues, but we need to help them get beyond that and broaden it a little bit. Yeah. You know, we actually are probably seeing more of that. Um, and again, I think it comes from these gender-specific things, and we try to get them out of it. Um, and we try to give them activities where they can do things together. But you're right, we, we probably are seeing much more of boys playing together and girls playing together more of that than we did, say, 15 or 20 years ago. Yes? Um, you mentioned how you said there's more harm in pushing kids ahead than there is good. There um, can be. Oh, there can be. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's a problem to be introducing the new things that could push them ahead over, like, requiring it? Or do you think it's like... You know, um, there's... You can introduce a lot of things. It just needs to be, and you can teach lots of things. I'm not at all suggesting that you hold children back in any way. Um, you need to meet them where they are and give them opportunities to grow and develop from that. Um, we've had kids at our school, we had a four-year-old one year who could go to the library and pick off any book and read it. I mean, she was amazing. But that's not the norm. What my concern is, is when you say children have to do things that they're not developmentally ready to do. When kids go into kindergarten classes nowadays, um, at least in Texas, the ones I'm familiar with, they are expected to know like 30 sight words and they're expected uh, to be reading by Christmas time and they're expected to do all these things that many of them are just not developmentally ready to do. So what does that do to a child's self-esteem? However, there are lots of ways to introduce all of those foundational skills that they need to do that sort of thing, all of those things they're going to need to be able to make those neural connections in age-appropriate ways so that they can learn and they're comfortable doing it. And that's, that's my point. I, I never want anybody to think that I want to hold a child back. Uh, I just don't want to push them into something they're not ready for and have them start off their school experiences on a downer. And how bad is that? <laughs> okay, you have
So you mentioned how standardized testing is progressively moving towards lower grades, like even kindergarten, you were saying. So how, but you know, it doesn't take away from the importance of play and finding your creativity and, you know, using the classroom as an outlet for their creativity. So how do you maintain that environment that allows the kids to be independent and, and be creative but still, um, not, I don't want to say train, but for lack of a better word, train them to take a standardized test. I think we have to have more faith in ourselves as teachers. Uh, and I think we have to have more faith in our kids that by doing things that are developmentally appropriate, they are going to be able to learn and they will be able to do well on the tests. When you teach to the test, uh, you're narrowing their scope tremendously. And that's not in the long run, doing anybody any good. Um, it'll be interesting, I had a meeting with a professor from the uh, University of Texas Health Science Center the other day, and we're gonna be part of a research program starting in January, and it's an assessment program, um, all computer-based. And we talked a little bit about that sort of thing, um, and whether those standardized tests really serve a good purpose or would we be better off going back to um, when I was in the elementary school classrooms and we would do content tests uh, and, and see from there where we needed to go. Um, I know there's, you know there's the push for core standards and, um, and it's difficult to move from state to state and even school district to school district and I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, I don't know, American education has always been a bit of a question to me because we tend to jump on the new bandwagon and we throw out the old and then we say, oops, that didn't work quite the way we thought it was going to. And somehow if we can kind of step back from it and use some common sense and think, okay, I'm open to this new idea, let's try it, but let's not get rid of the tried and true in the process. Let's see how they can work together and then go in whatever direction we find, find is best. But I, I think we're just too quick to jump into the new things without really giving enough thought uh, or without giving enough trial periods. You know, we don't. Um, we have a computer teacher who comes in once a week and teaches computer skills to the kindergarten children. And we have a computer in the kindergarten. The children rarely show any interest in it. Um, but I have to also say that I teach in a rather affluent part of Houston, and all of the kids in, my, in our school are very, very familiar with iPads, iPhones, um, Game Boys, computers, they have it all. If I were teaching in a different environment, I might be more interested in bringing in more technology, but right now, our kids are more interested in actually handling the physical things because they don't get that at home. They have computers at home. So again, you have to find a balance. I, I, I'm not saying one thing is is bad or good or anything else. They all have their place. Um, but, you know, those of us who are older are living examples of the fact that in order to be knowledgeable about the computer, you don't have to start when you're two. Um, I didn't use a computer until I was, I don't know, 50 or something. And I'm fairly good at it. Um, I'm not gonna be a programmer, but I can certainly make my way around computers. So. Um, and besides which, what we teach them when they're three and four is not what they're going to be using when they're in middle school and high school. Because look how fast technology changes. I mean, you used to be able to go to Target and see the new thing that came out. And now you go to Target and you see the new 50 things that have come out. And it's kind of hard to keep up with them all. So, um, you know, the argument of, well, they have to do it now because otherwise they're not going to be ready for the future is not really very valid. Anything else? Yes. Uh, what does assessment what does assessment look like in your school? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, basically, we do ongoing assessment, and the teachers are encouraged to keep notes um, on a daily or at least weekly basis. Um, and I 
I encourage them to keep those notes in whatever form is comfortable for them because if I say you have to keep a clipboard or you have to keep a 3 by 5 file, if that's not comfortable for them, they're not going to do it. So they have uh, complete autonomy as to how they do that, but they need to keep these notes. And then they, we have portfolios and we pull things out periodically and put them in the portfolios. Um, we do do the Gazelle Developmental Assessment with our pre-Ks um, in January, and that, that um, kind of helps us along with our daily observations of the children, see how they're progressing and helps us help parents decide whether or not they're going to be ready to go on to kindergarten because unfortunately um, registration for programs starts happening in January and February. So um, it's a long time from February until next May, um, August or September, and it's hard to make those leaps. With some kids, it's really easy. You know they're going to be ready to go on. With others, it's iffy, and then there's some who you think, oh, you know, being in a class of 25 kids with one teacher and trying to maneuver that cafeteria line is just going to eat them alive. Um, so we do do this ongoing thing. Now this year, we're starting something new. Um, I don't know how it's going to work. It's a computer-based assessment program that comes from Frog Street Press. Um, it assesses probably more than you would want to know, but it's kind of an interesting program. We have it set up on an iPad, and um, the teachers or I or my assistant can go and sit down with a child and um, say we want to see whether or not they know all their lowercase letters. So we just open this thing up, <coughs> plug in their name, and we open it up and it'll show, say, a lowercase f, and they, they tell you what it is. If they answer it correctly, the teacher presses yes. If not, she presses no. And then you go on to the next letter. Well, when you get it finished, it automatically gives you a bar graph. It, it, once you do the whole class, because you set this up in classes, once you get the whole class, it will identify which children missed which words so you can just go to that and say, oh, okay, I need to do a small group activity with this group of children. It looks really cool. We're just starting it. I don't know how it's going to work, um, but we're going we're gonna to see. Yes? Um, has there been any difference, and, and this is kind of hard to follow up with, but with past graduate students from your school compared to graduate students from another pre-K or elementary school and how they perform? their, like, let's say, later elementary? Um, I don't really have a whole lot of information on that, but what I can tell you is uh, the public school pre-Ks, being public schools, have to do a lot more measurable activities than we do. So we focus more on foundational skills, but still give lots of opportunities for learning sight words. For instance, you know, rather than having our children memorize sight words, we do things like um, we'll have a big pad of paper and we'll do the news of the day and the children will dictate things to us and we'll write them on this piece of paper. So they, they get the idea of top to bottom, left to right. We begin to identify words that show up all the time, I, me, our, there. We look at punctuation. So we're talking about all of these things as part and parcel of their words, their interests, their their life experiences. We dictate stories and we write them down. And again, they get the top to bottom, left to right, and we start looking at words. So we're teaching all of those things, but not in um, a, the specific way that we would need to teach them in order to actually measure them. So, and I explain this to parents all the time. When your child leaves a traditional uh, early childhood program and goes into kindergarten or first grade, they are initially going to look like they're behind because those public school kids are going to look like they know more. But within the first six weeks, that starts to level out because the children who have had the more traditional age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate foundational skills suddenly pull beyond the public school kids who have spent more time memorizing. Now, I don't mean that to sound like I'm knocking public schools because there are lots of educational philosophies and they all work, but they don't all work for all kids. Um, and so I encourage parents when they're trying to decide where to send their children to school to go and look and see if it looks as if that program is going to be a good fit for their child. 
Montessori is great, but it's not great for everybody. Um, highly academic programs and the way we think of academics with sitting down and doing paper and pencil tasks and that sort of thing, they're great for certain kids, but not for everybody. Um, so it, it kind of depends a lot on the children and on the programs. But generally speaking, I would say that our kids do as well or better as kids coming out of the public school pre-K programs. Um, one of the things that I hate about ours, and I hope that there are others that are better, but our public school pre-Ks have kids there from 8.30 in the morning until 2.45 in the afternoon, and they get 15 minutes of recess. That, to me, is criminal. Um, and they have centers, but the centers are, are very academically oriented, so it's when you go to the center and you do math stuff. But you can learn a lot of those math things by building blocks and by stringing beads and by doing all kinds of other things that are a lot more fun. Yes. So I hand in the back. Um, when you're interviewing or looking for a teacher, what are the key things that tell you this is a great teacher? That tell me this is a great teacher? Yeah. You know, I'm probably a lousy um, interviewer. <laughs> I go a lot on gut. <laughs> How do you know somebody's going to be a teacher um, for young Yeah, that, that, that is a very good question. And, and of course, I teach in a small school with a home-like environment, which means that not only do I have to hire teachers who um, know what they're doing, but I also have to hire teachers who are going to be team players, uh, because we all work very closely together, and you get one bad apple in the pot, and you're in trouble. And I've had that experience. Um, I, I talk with them about their education, about their experiences in the classroom. Um, I talk with them about how they would handle certain scenarios, um, you know, fighting in the block corner, um, um, in altercation on the playground. And, uh, we just kind of talk through things like that. If at all possible, I love to have them come in and substitute teacher teach or help out in the classroom before I have to do hiring. Sometimes that's not possible because it happens in the summer and we are not a year-round program. Um, but some of it is just kind of a gut feeling. Uh, there's some people who I come in and, and I talk with them and I just think, no, this isn't going to be a good fit. Um, I probably could use some extra help in interviewing skills, but so far, mostly so good. There have been a few issues over the years, but not too many. Tell the tell about um, when you ask them about their needs. Their needs. When you, oh, yeah, their yeah, needs. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I was I was telling. Uh, I was talking at lunch about that. Sometimes in the summertime, I get some women who are kind of fifty-ish. They've maybe worked in business, taken early retirement. They've taught Sunday school. They enjoy children. And they come in and they say, oh, this is such a cute school. I'd really like to work here. And the first thing I say is, well, how are your knees? And they kind of look at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, when you're working with young children, you have to do a lot of deep knee bends because you have to speak with them at eye level. And there's a lot of up and down kind of stuff. And uh, when you're sitting at a table with them, you have to sit at little low chairs, at low tables. And that takes a toll on their knees. And then I have... Um, from the old days of the NAEYC accreditation, I still have some of the old classroom observation booklets, and it's kind of a neat little mini course in classroom management, what a school ought to look like. So I give that to them, and I kind of go through some of the high points, and I say, take this home and read it, and then, um, you know, give me a call and you come back and we'll talk some more. I never hear from them again. <laughs> One, one did, one time, decide that she was going to try it. And actually, she had a lot of good points, and I really felt she would be a good teacher, and she was. But she only lasted six months because her knees gave out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, thank you so You're much. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Naomi. So one thing I'm thinking of, so the, the one thing that I'm taking, well, I'm taking away a lot of things from this, but the, the, the one that I'm really jazzed about right now is just this idea of all of us, like, when, so when we're in our classrooms, right, just our eyes and ears are open for how we can use the stuff that's available to us, right? right. In all different ways, and that we don't need to, you know, the classroom, we, um, there's so much available to us that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money that, 
but that if we're if we're thinking creatively and we're thinking in this kind of you know how can I use this in multiple ways right and letting the the kids show us too like how we can use this that's stuff. really important because no. <laughs> um, that's really important because um, you know we used to think we had to show kids things uh, if we were going to do some sort of a project there would be a teacher made um, thing that we would show them but often if you give them the materials they come up with ideas that are far better than you ever thought of and they can take it to another level or often another direction which is just marvelous so you know teaching especially young children and I say that because that's my general area of expertise, if you will, but um, it's, it's very demanding. It's physically demanding, it's mentally demanding, it's emotionally demanding. You have to be on your toes all the time. You have to be looking for those teachable moments. But boy, it is one of the most rewarding things you can ever do. It's exhausting, it can be exhausting, um, but it's a fantastic thing. And when you see those aha moments, when you see those wheels go around, when you see an idea click, or you see a child just take something and run with it, it is just so rewarding. And you know that you're making a huge, huge difference in their lives. So go for it. More power to you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Naomi. And thank you, uh, everybody, for coming. So I have these, I have these questions, but I, I think we're, I think we're uh, running out of time now. Yeah, so... Um, but what I was thinking we could do is we could um, we could post these questions and get responses from you um, on them, and then we could make sure that everybody has a chance to see them. Do it on Twitter, right? Yeah, we're only going to actually we're going to not even do it on Twitter. There's another program where you have to do it in four words. Not scared. No. <laughs> well, just you can have pages. You can you can write for pages on these. You can't do anything in four words. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's give uh, Naomi a big round of applause. Thank you again, and um, there's a reception right out front, and you can come up and uh, meet Naomi, meet each other, uh, get to know each other, enjoy, and thank you again so much for kicking our alumni series, uh, speaker series off. What a great way to start. Thank you, Naomi.